Ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful good morning here in the city of Vienna. I'm delighted that uh, you attend our session on using technology to connect people. My name is Klaus Miesenberger. I'm professor for computer science at the University of Linz. Linz is a small city about 200 kilometers to the west from Vienna. And yeah, there, since 30 years, I do research development in assistive technology accessibility. And we also run a, a center for students with disabilities. We have a spin-off uh, taking care for transfer of technology into practice. We produce about 2,000 school books every year for students with disabilities and some things more. So that's my boring time over the last 30 years. And so I'm so honored to be here with you. I don't take my nine minutes. I think it's much more interesting to see the s selected practices and to listen to them. And I only will introduce them shortly by saying the name and then inviting them to give the presentation. Uh, for the first one, uh, Robin Way and Jeremy Way, Community Connection Australia, and uh, Jenny Mobile, I only wanted to say there is there is a video included, and this includes audio description. If you are interested and if you're in need of using audio description, take your headphone and select channel number one. And channel, channel number one will display to you the audio description. I think this is one of the few sessions where I'm happy to say please do not turn off your electronic equipment because it's about using apps. And I'm sure they are delighted that you go to the web page, that you download it and blow up their part the participation. But nevertheless, please pay considerable attention to our presentations. So let me introduce once more Robin and um, Jeremy, and we are looking forward to your technology to your solution, to your connecting activities. Please. Can you hear me up the back? Good. Um, just to clear up one confusion which may be in your minds as to why two ways are doing a joint uh, presentation. Um, we are the second and third generation in our family uh, to be uh, caught up and uh, captured by disability. My sister Jennifer was born with cerebral palsy. That it meant that my parents uh, established the first parent-run organisation in the world for cerebral palsy. Um, I swore I would never do it, so did Jeremy, but here we are. So let me tell you about what we're doing. CCA has provided Community Connections Australia is a small organisation operating in Sydney. We have provided services, individualised support services to people with all types and degrees of disability across the Sydney region. We've concentrated on finding solutions for people so they can be active and visible players at home and in their wider community. They range from the daily, uh, personal care issues, the usual shopping, cleaning, cooking, support, um, and community access, and every layer of people's lives get caught up in our service provision. There are emerging issues for people, such as health, personal relationships issues, lack of friends, lousy jobs, the list is long, and the people that we support trust us enough to be able to ask for assistance in all sorts of areas. What we found, though, was that problems and limitations around people's lack of experiential learning arose. And these became one of the, mari uh, the major barriers for people's entry into a real life in their own home and as equal players in community activities. The positive uh, decisions that people have to make in their everyday living is 
much more difficult if you've never had to make those choices and made bad decisions and made wrong decisions and find yourself having to, again, um, ask for assistance. So we decided that there needed to be a different way of doing this and that ordinary, everyday technology that everybody was using in the community for reasons of uh, cost, uh, of people not believing that anybody with a disability could possibly use ordinary, everyday technology, overrode their wishes to be independent. So that led to the establishment of our Genie program as a separate division to investigate options and ways of addressing this problem. And Jeremy will talk about this shortly. The most important outcome now, though, is that we have hundreds of stories um, of how people have moved into their own life, taken control of their own life, and have a very different life than they had before they started using technology. I'll hand you to Jeremy. Thanks, Robin. Um, so my name's Jeremy. Um, I actually run Genie Mobile, which is now a separate organisation. Um, so the problem, the problem that we faced very, very, very quickly is that the, um, as Robin has said, direct person-to-person -person support was not always the answer for independence and autonomy. It's expensive, it, it can create dependency, and it limits experiential learning. But technology is not necessarily the answer in and of itself, because it can be expensive, particularly when it is assistive technology. I've no idea why assistive technology costs the way it does. It's one of the reasons why we started the business that we do. Ubiquitous technology is often denied to people, and by ubiquitous technology I mean these things, smartphones. Um, smartphones for us seem to be the obvious choice of, of the way to go, um, but we found accessibility issues paramount wherever we went. And part of the problem with a smartphone is that it requires an under, underlying telecommunication plan, um, and they are often prohibitively expensive and contractually difficult for people to obtain, particularly in Australia. So, Robin's already touched on experiential learning. I won't labour on the point here, um, but we all learn by doing. We learn by making mistakes, and often what we found over 30 plus years of supporting people who live with disabilities to live independently in their homes is that people who live with disabilities are often denied um, the ability to make these mistakes on their own. So, experiential learning and the gap in experiential learning was a real issue. Um, it still is an issue, um, but people people still need support to live independently. You have, you've got to deal with the unexpected situations, um, what happens when you're anxious or upset, or just to talk through an issue. So we created uh, what we call our 24-7 help service, our big red button app, and it is literally just an app that sits on, on a smartphone. But it has three, three legs to the stool, as it were. The first is a 24-7 help centre staffed by specialist staff that are there to solve problems, any problems that a person may have. The, the service is underpinned also by an app, very, very simple smartphone app. It tracks GPS. Um, it's very, very simplified user interface. And the third and really important underlying issue is that we are able to provide the underlying tailored mobile phone plans. Um, they're designed specifically to meet the needs of people who live with disabilities. We had to become the telco. We took on a commercial business model um, and we do things that the big telcos in, in Australia can't or won't, simply won't do. It's a commercial business model. We conceived Genie Mobile to be um, self-funding from the outset. We have a small but growing customer base. Um, we've tripled our our uh, customer base over the last three years, and we have only this year achieved marginal break-even position. It's been very, very tough going. So, learnings. I'll just wrap up quickly because I want to get to the video at the end that shows the user story. The learnings. Um, 
many people lack the experiential learning necessary for technology as well. Just because you put a phone in the, in the hands of someone, don't expect that someone has the experiential learning to use the phone. We have had to um, support people and develop technology hubs, as we call them, which are peer-based support groups that train people in how to use technology from the start. The business model has been absolutely brutal. Um, one of the quotes that uh, our wholesale telecommunication provider, who's the second largest um, network in Australia, says to us is, you may be a not-for-profit, but we are not. And it is brutal. Um, but we've, we've worked our way through it. But at the end of the day, we measure our success by our user stories. And that is it. So let me just show you, introduced Adrian, who is, um, who is one of our customers. Um, and this tells everything, really. Thank you. turn on. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation and really the amazing spread out which you found seeing the statistics and if I, I, if I took my math right it's an exponential equation we have here and we are expecting a lot more going out. Yeah, it's, um, it, is, it has been ex exponential and it's the, the typical hockey stick growth that you see in a startup. Yeah. That's what we like to tell our investors anyway. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. If I'm right, if I ask the colleagues here, we do questions at the end, right? And we proceed, and so let me proceed to our next presentations. Lucia Xabai, right? Helpific. Good. So this always pronouncing is very difficult, but I did my <laughs> job, and so let me hand over the floor is yours. Yeah, especially the Hungarian language is very difficult. So thank you for the opportunity. We are very uh, glad to have a chance to introduce the Helpific platform for you. And uh, let's start from the very beginning because it was a very special moment in our uh, working method. Helpific was established in 2014 in Tallinn as a, very, as a result of a very special hackathon event, a social hackathon event called Enable Hackathon. And uh, the development process uh, was uh, based on uh, the user experiences. And uh, at first, KU Rosemary's idea was to create a platform or find a ways to support a successful, trustful relationship between vulnerable people and other uh, local citizens in the community. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So uh, that, uh, this was the first idea, and since then we still develop the platform together um, in several uh, national groups. And today the platform has more than 6,300 registered members and has created more than 700 successful connections with individuals with disabilities and other fellow citizens uh, based on neighborhoods and different geographic areas. So, um, in our development model, we cooperate with universities, NGOs, service providers, and uh, other institutions, uh, service users, to, to make it better, to uh, make it more barrier-free. And uh, in order to pilot our uh, Helpific platform to different geographic, um, cultural, and legal contexts. So, we are in the process to create the network of different Helpific initiatives, and uh, we would be glad to extend our activity to other countries as well. So, 
This is the picture uh, about our network, actually. <laughs> yes. Um, so Helpific actually is a web-based uh, enabling environment for individuals with disabilities to support their um, social connections to create uh, based in the local community. Through this platform, we would like to solve some general problems related, for example, to the social inclusion, the community inclusion of disabled people, and also some cost-related problems related to the current social welfare system. Through the Helpific platform, we would be um, solve these problems, and we would like to mobilize local resources in neighborhoods and uh, increase the social capital of disabilities. Um, and contribute, finally, the social inclusion. This is one of the most important aim of us. So we truly believe that community is manifestation of social capital. And uh, state policies often promote community inclusion uh, through their programs, but these programs mostly focus on individuals, but not connecting them to the community. So this is what we would like to achieve through the Helpific platform. Um, participation and inclusion will only a reality if real caring communities, real um, functional communities, should be, say this, uh, can be created and developed. And this is what we should do it together. And uh, the Helpific platform is just one part of this and one tool for this. Helpific play an important role to work on both sides, supporting individuals to find their ways in society and support reintegration process and support recreation of social network in which people are mutually supportive to each other, including persons with disability. And here is the platform. Yes, I have five minutes left. So he, this is the first view of our platform. And you can see that here is the place where you can put a you can submit an idea to um, related requests or offers. And if any help request or help offer is published, an automated email not notification is sent out to all the registered members in that given area. Uh, based on our experiences, this is a very uh, important tool. The email notifications are extremely useful tool to get answers for the help request. And we also advertise each uh, help request on our social media sites as well. This seems to be a self-generating process, actually. More help requests drive more traffic to the platform, and more traffic leads more registrations. With more registrations, we have a larger chance to get answers for the help request. And um, our users will be uh, very uh, optimistic and motivated to use the help uh, Helpific platform regularly. This is the most important um, um, aim for us. And uh, the other important thing is that uh, when a help seeker gets connected uh, with a helper and the help has been provided, we call it matchmaking. This is a very important word in our term. And uh, the main purpose of the Helpific platform actually is to enable matchmakings uh, by providing an easy, fast, and safe online tool. Um, safety is a very important issue in our working method, and um, related to this, we uh, very highlight the importance of consumer relations, which is a very important part of our uh, team members and the uh, task of the team members. Uh, actually, uh, we identified seven different categories uh, in our system, and um, Requesting personal assistance is one of the most uh, common form of help requests, and 16% of the help requests are transportation, home-related tasks, leisure-related tasks. 8% um, of the requests were about education, helping in small uh, works and assignments, and in some cases, not, not individuals, but uh, different organization requested helps. They usually were seeking for volunteers, and uh, for their clients or people to have to organize events. So in conclusion, Happyfic platform has been developed as an answer to the challenges of the current welfare system. The platform connects citizens on 
peer-to-peer -peer level, strengthening neighborhoods and local citizens. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Thanks so much Lucia. Uh, short question. Does your model also include service providers for people with disabilities to bring their services to clients, new clients? Uh, no. No. I would be interested in talk about this. And perhaps some people more, I know. Yeah. In the room, perhaps. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions, please note down the audience, note down your questions. We will open the floor for discussion after our third presentation, which comes from Brittany Dijen, Able Thrive, and please, the floor is yours. The Thank third you. app to look at. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brittany. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share Able Thrive with you. Um, do I? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, first, I'll start with how I got here. Um, my dad had, uh, was in a car accident when I was 12 years old and became a quadriplegic. So for the last 20 years of my life, we, our family has adapted and learned how to live with um, different uh, limitations and ways to adapt to the world. Um, when I got to, for me this became very normal, I was very young, I didn't think much about it. But when I got to college, I studied abroad in China and spent time in a rehab hospital where I met someone who had more physical mobility than my dad, who told me he would spend the rest of his life in bed. And that's when I realized that, wait, you know, we, we lived near a big city. They had a great spinal cord injury hospital. We had peer mentors. My dad learned how to rebuild his life uh, being paralyzed from the chest down and having his fingers paralyzed, and lived independently, went back to work, did all of these things that I took for granted as normal. And Able Thrive was born out of wanting to make that possible for others. Um, so that's my dad and I, <laughs> a couple months ago. Um, so we are a US-based nonprofit, but everything we do is online. Um, and we started by wanting to create a platform where people with paralysis and their families could access information related to um, life skills, parenting, relationships, activities, and travel. Big topics that were coming up in a lot of Facebook groups and other places we saw. Um, we also got into wanting to promote inclusion as well, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And a real big part of it for us was also looking at the opportunity to collaborate. I was starting to learn more and more about a lot of the incredible work being done in the sector, and so um, we've also built a global network of partners, which I'll explain. Um, so the problem that we started with was that, um, you know, 20 years ago we weren't looking on the internet after my dad was hurt, um, but that really exploded in the years since. And the problem was that um, when I first started looking at this problem back in 2006, there really wasn't a lot online, and then in the uh, decade plus since, everything was online. But everything went online in ways that were uh, not necessarily intuitive for someone who entered the world of, uh, for in my case, we were looking at spinal cord injury. So people's instincts started to be to go to Google, but there was nothing to say, if you Googled spinal cord injury, nothing was gonna tell you what to do first, where to go, or even just the simple fact that your life wasn't over. And we wanted to find a way to simplify that for people. And so we created a one, uh, so at AbleThrive.com, there's a platform that we focused on first curation. So what is out there? What are the incredible organizations, hospitals, bloggers, um, YouTubers, all of these, all these wonderful entities have been throwing all this content online, how to get dressed, um, dealing with the emotional trauma, all these kinds of things, but they were all spread out all over the internet. And so we started building partnerships and pulling them onto Able Thrive's platform in what we call our curation model. So when you see a post on Able Thrive, 95% of them uh, didn't originate with us. We built these partnerships with their consent to say, hey, we want to be a microphone or an amplifier for the work that you've done. And so we'll pull it in and we always backlink to the source and make sure we show where it came from. But it's a way for us to um, make it simpler for someone to not have to go to hundreds of websites on their own. Um, the next step was customization, because now we have over 1,400 posts on the site in these different categories. Um, and so we uh, wanted people to be able to have that information customized to them. So when you register for a free account on Able Thrive, you're actually asked, what are you interested in out of the categories we cover? 
and then a few questions about the mobility of your arms, fingers, trunk, and legs, whether you have full, partial, or no mobility. And based on that, we customize a, a MyAble Thrive feed, which pulls out the posts from our site that are relevant to you for topics that are specifically tied to mobility, like transferring in bed or getting dressed or things like that. Um, and then we also have a section that's more, ba more general because um, not everything that people want to collaborate or learn about is tied to mobility. So um, the platform as it exists, as I just explained, is shared in 16 spinal cord injury hospitals in four countries. Um, when we take that quiz that I just described about the mobility, a lot of the people working in the spinal cord injury hospitals have been really happy because they might be next to a ventilator dependent quadriplegic and they fill out the form and they just have to refresh it and they can fill it out for a paraplegic. And so the more and more time we found that hospital workers were spending on Google with their patients, valuable time that they've been spending uh, online, we wanted to shorten that and get people what they need. We have over 15,000 unique visitors coming to AbleThrive.com every month. And um, in the things that we've done in terms of inclusion online and videos, and we launched a campaign with the hashtag This Is How I a couple years ago just to demonstrate what people were doing. Everything from painting to um, driving to, you know, anything that anyone wanted to share that people thought they didn't do or assumed they wouldn't be able to do. And um, when I mentioned before the, the campaigns around inclusion, we launched a campaign in 2016 um, called Thrive Worldwide. And we just wanted to bring out the, the energy around the world towards people living life to the fullest, which is one of our core values. And so in 2016, we started with four meetups in three countries on December 3rd, the International Day of People with Disabilities. Um, and uh, last, this past one, December 3rd of 2018, we were up to 43 meetups in 15 countries, which mobilized over 1,300 people. So that was just, and that's just our partners, our supporters, everybody who could agree with us that we got one life, let's get after it and live it to the fullest the best way we can. People go out to bars for a happy hour, they went bowling, they, we didn't micromanage it, we just wanted people to go out and have fun. And that's been growing um, every year. And then uh, we have over 250 partners in 13 countries, uh, many of whom we source content from that come into Able Thrive's platform. So this is just, uh, this is um, a man named Buddy who's a ventilator dependent quadriplegic. He was referred to Able Thrive by his spinal cord injury rehab hospital. And so he said that he loved when he was able to share the mobility of his body because he has such limited mobility. A lot of times when he would find things online, he'd get really excited only to find that there was something that he wasn't gonna be able to do. And on Able Thrive, he was able to say, no movement below the neck. And so the things that came through to him on our site were only things that were relevant to him. Um, and so, we um, currently are sustained with donations and corporate sponsorships, um, a lot in the disability world, like companies who tell stories, who want to put their name on content. Um, we also do generate some revenue from products we feature, the affiliate marketing. My, we had someone on our team um, who is, has cerebral palsy, uses very specific weightlifting hooks for him to do pull-ups. And my dad just bought them because they help him work out at the gym. Com different disability, but it's an avenue for collaboration. And so that's a way that our goal is to connect solutions like that, um, but it also generates a bit of revenue for us. But what's most important for us is that we keep it free for the users, um, and, and we're always looking for new ways to innovate, including the next steps for us, which I'm very, very excited about. This is the project we're focusing on for 2019. But we did figure out that through the work that we've done that we covered a lot of things in kind of the lifeline of spinal cord injury. It was, you have the injury, you have the rehab phase, you transition home, and then life. And when we started doing customer research, we found that um, our channels to get people into our site came from rehab hospitals. So they were in the rehab phase. And our users were starting to tell us that this is great and we trust you, like this is good content, but you're in life phase and I'm not there yet. So now for 2019, we're building digital education modules for early spinal cord injury. So we're about to launch the first phase of that. It's eight chapters that are under three minutes to read each that cover things like spinal cord injury basics, um, what to expect in rehab, coping, bladder management, bowel management, skin, eight chapters that will get that kicked off. And we're currently working on phase two, 
When we piloted the concept of the first phase in 2018, we had 94% of the 60 or so people with spinal cord injury whose feedback we asked for wished that these had existed when they were first injured. We want to make it so people aren't going through Google and trying to figure out what they're supposed to find and what's useful, what's relevant. And so now for 2019, we have that motivation to build phase two, to launch phase one, and really build a program that's going to build the stepping stones to um, the platform we have existing now. So thank you for your time and attention. Thanks so much, Brittany. Short one, if I could start, uh, is it, are there considerations also to expand other groups of people with disabilities? Um, definitely. I mean, I think no matter how you enter the disability world, either giving birth to a child or an accident, a diagnosis, that period of time, I think, is when it's most people are most vulnerable, at least my family was. And so that's, that's what we'd like to be able to guide people through that time. But we got to show it can work once, yeah. so. <laughs> Uh, once more, thank you for your presentation and uh, thanks for all the three presentation about the apps and let me open the discussion uh, to the audience. Are there immediate pressing questions people want to ask? If not, uh, let me start with a simple one. There is one, sorry. The microphone, please. Yes. Okay, I think, oh, it works, yeah. <laughs> um, concerning the Genie Mobile solution, you said you have a 24-7 call center on supporting public transport. So, but what can I expect from it? I mean, in Vienna, we have a lot of stuff done for public transport usage. How is the situation in Australia, actually? Okay, so, um the whole point of our help centre <clears throat> was to answer all of the questions that anyone living with any type of disability may come across. Um, public transport is just one element of it. Um, we included GPS tracking in the app because we found that there were a number of people with cognitive disabilities who tended to get lost. Um, when they started to engage in their local communities, but we wanted to solve the problem of how can someone live independently in their own community without the need to have a physical support worker alongside them for 24 hours of the day. So what we found is that the sort of calls that we receive um, to our help centre include the basics such as, help, I've fallen, I'm bleeding and I need an ambulance. We've had a few of those. Through to, um, I've missed the bus or in Australia early on, it's changed a little now, but um, we did not have our entire bus fleet in Sydney, which was accessible for wheelchairs. And so we would often have timetable changes where an accessible vehicle was supposed to be on the, on the particular bus route, um, only to find that it had been substituted for a non-accessible vehicle. So we've had, to have, we've had several instances where we've had to um, phone bus depots on behalf of, of particular customers to say, what is going on? We've got someone who is sitting at a bus stop and can't wait for four hours for the next accessible vehicle. Um, and we do everything in between. We have a number of people that phone us just for a chat because they've had a bad day. Or they're feeling anxious because the person across the road is looking at them in a funny way. Anything in between. So it's, it's solving problems that arise that um, that inhibit people's um, ability to engage with their local community. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, what, what's the kind of age demographic for Genie users? Um, for the help centre, it, it varies. Um, we have a number of um, a number of very young. Oh, well, not very young, um, sort of the 17, 18 year old through to 24 year old. It really depends on how a person is going to start their independence journey. At what point are they going to be living independently? So we also have a number of people that are in their 60s that are moving into the community for the first time as well. 
Um, but it's not just limited to disability. We're finding a number of customers that are coming in from the ageing community as well um, because our service is a mobile service that provides um, just a point of reassurance for people as they move about in their communities. Luke, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, f first remark, um, I I'm, I'm not sure whether I, whether I agree with what Brittany said. Maybe I misunderstood. Uh, you said you have rehab and then you have life. I think for many people, rehab is part of life and maybe we should make sure that, that also during rehab periods there is a real life uh, where you can participate and, and, and be part of the, of the community. So maybe you could clarify that uh, a little bit. Um, I, I'm representing a network of support services, a European network of support services for persons with disabilities. We're active in, in, in providing educational support, employment support, um, all kinds of, of, of services, also rehabilitation services. And we see that there is a huge gap between between what these services do and what technology offers. And, and the chair was already hinting in that direction uh, earlier on. I would like to, to know from, from the panelists uh, if, you, if you would uh, recommend support services on how to bridge that gap, what type of recommendations would, would you give? Because there is a sort of a digital divide and we are working on closing it, but it seems to be very difficult. Um. We cover all sorts of types and degrees of disability, and that's also age groupings. So our support is targeted to the family unit, if there is one, or the individual. And generally, we work very closely with the families so that we all have a very clear game plan about where the services will go. Albeit that, um, individuals often have different plans and uh, hopes than their families do. And so it's a negotiation process and at some point um, we will uh, be very clear about um, who's driving the plan. Um, because if you're an adult, you're entitled to make your mistakes and you're entitled to have services that maybe you're parents wouldn't approve of because they are a little overprotective and they don't see their son or daughter using um, uh, prostitution services where they're available. Um, so it's, um, that's the point of making it a very individual process. That then flows through to safety and security issues both at home and in the community. And the beauty for Jeannie and for family uh, in particular is that it gives them some sense that if their person is really in trouble, there is somebody at the end of the phone who will take control of that problem and solve it in some way, which may include them, it may include the police, it may include ambulances. We've had people um, go off into the bush um, in summertime and have a drink because the service that they're living in won't permit them to have alcohol because of their medication. Um, they go to sleep, they wake up in the dead of night, in the dark, in the bush. Um, who, what are they going to do and who, where are the police going to be looking? That's where the GPS enablement is critical uh, to keeping people safe and secure. Can I just jump in on, on the digital, the question on the digital divide in particular, that's a, that's a really tough one and we've had to cross that um, in a number of ways. Um, there is an assumption that people who live with disabilities can't use technology yeah. and um, we cross that a lot and what we find is that um, often it's the families that are preventing that from happening. Yeah. And so the first thing that we have to do is to convince the families that um, putting one of these devices in, in their person's hands is not going to suddenly cause the earth to, to fall over and tilt on its side. Um, what we have found is that it, everyone's journey is different and everyone is on a, on a, on a, a spectrum and it's obvious, but, um, but what we have found is that even people who have 
have the most profound intellectual disabilities, yeah. once you train, once they're trained properly in how to use the device, um, they actually treasure the devices and they look after them much, much more than, um, than yeah. my kids do. Um, so it's a, it's a real issue and it's something that we address, but we have to, as Robin says, it's an individualised thing, it's a one-on-one -on -one discussion and we struggle with how do you scale that. Uh, if Alec perhaps could bring in Able Thrive and uh, Helpific, uh, because I think the question was also much more oriented towards these professional service providers which might be received or looked at as very conservative, and also, as you say, the parents hindering, often we hear feedback that also these organizations are hitting back. Do you see Able Thrive and uh, Helpific, the apps as a tool which could be helpful for the organizations to, a bit disruptive of course, but to change the way of service provision, to integrate them yeah. into new models of service provision? Actually, we, uh, we are in the process to develop a new application platform for the service providers. Mm -hmm. It's we call the Helpific Pro, which will, um, we, we hope that it will be help to um, reach this gap or to, um, to find a way how can to use the Helpific platform through the service providing process. So, um, so we uh, really would like to make it uh, accessible for, uh, for, uh, for the organizations as well. And there are have successful uh, connections with uh, other service providers who, st who started already to use the platform, for example, in Germany. Yeah. So, um, so yes. Yeah. Available. I really like the idea of such an open platform because, so to say, one approach could be that each service provider develops his own platform mm -hmm. to keep people connected. And I think this open platform and approach, and uh, Luke might be a person you could talk to who might be very much interested in such a development. And I wanted to say too, like a lot of what we've done has been in partnership with a lot of institutions, not necessarily like only the service providers within um, like spinal cord injury care at this point, but um, yeah, we look at it, try to be complementary. Because I don't think, like for example, we're not trying to replace peer mentoring groups. I think if you can have a peer mentor and they can sit next to you and talk to you in person, is that's the best. It just is not everyone has access to it, and so we want to fill that gap. And I wanted to also address the the kind of rehab life issue. Um, so from an American context. Um, when my dad was injured 20 years ago, he had five months of inpatient rehab. That number is down to 37 days. And you've got people becoming, can go home as fast from rehab as two weeks. And so there isn't a lot of time to talk about life in the sense of some of the categories we cover are activities and travel, like things that, you know, people are still trying to figure out how to go to the bathroom when, and then they're home. And so um, one thing that we found is in building these early stage modules, we're actually pulling some of the early stage content out of um, like separating between early stage and trying to figure out like a bit of a timeline um, because one thing we were losing some people in rehab who saw the travel heading and were like, vacation, like I, what? Like I I'm, can't put my pants on, right? So, so we, there is definitely like, I think sometimes in other countries that, that take, that give more time in rehab, there's more like uh, ability, I think, to integrate the aid, like life skills and, and transit, like time to build transitioning home into that program. But in the United States right now, unless you're really wealthy um, or some know someone in the right place, like you're going home really, really fast. And so we wanna help, again, support, because the, the a lot of the hospital workers are like, we do the patient education in person. They need to hear these things eight times. I tell them once and then they're home. And so it's again that partnership of like, how can we all collaborate and, and make the best of both worlds. Thank you very much. Uh, we are coming close to an end of our session. One more question. Uh, my question's to Brittany. Uh, you say you've done about 43 meetups in 15 countries. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what these meetups are and how uh, they've helped the business per se? Um, sure, so basically back in 2016, we, like I said, we just put out a call, like if you agree with us that live life to the fullest and you wanna show what it means to thrive. Um, so we, in we invited people to 
do whatever that meant for them. So we went first to our partners, and then people were into it because we and we have, we didn't have any money for it, you know. So this has all been done <laughs> just to, you know. They take themselves out to happy hour or whatever. Some organizations already bring their community together, so it was a good partnership to say, if you bring your community together and you do it on this day, you'll be doing it on the same day as hundreds of people around the world. Um, and so there's really no specific form. All we've asked is that they check in. So we have a couple YouTube videos that I've edited together at the end, like, hey, we're checking in from, you know, wherever, and pull that all together. And it just, I've had the, great privilege of being able to travel to a lot of different countries, meeting a lot of different people with disabilities, and in over the last decade, and found that uh, there's a lot more in common than not. And by pulling people together, that's an open invitation. Next, this December 3rd, anyone wants to get friends together, uh, let me know, because we'll loop you in. And we just want to grow it, because I think sometimes the disability stuff can get really heavy, and, and it, it's all, the policy stuff, it's all really important, but we wanted to also make sure there's time to celebrate and just time to have a good time. Um, Business-wise, it doesn't make us any money, it doesn't, it, it's been really about putting our values out in the world and trying to recruit people around us and around this idea and bringing visibility for our partners in whatever part of the world that they're in. Thank you very much once more. Thanks a lot to the speakers for the wonderful presentation. Perhaps we give them a hand at the end. And let me say, when we break down this uh, formal discussion, I'm very really convinced that this will start a lot of discussion amongst the community, uh, tie up with them. And finally, let me say, there is a strong trend that more and more people jump into app development, community platform setup. I often have the feeling that, so to say, if you don't know what to do, let's make an app. <laughs> and these are three examples which really make a difference we can learn from that the developments, uh, the systems we are building up really make a difference to people, learn from each other and connect these apps and these systems together to help people to make a better life from day to day. Thank you very much and enjoy your lunch.